Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Alicia Pedowitz. I'm the Director of Teen Education here at Moving Traditions, um, where I oversee, um, first of all, our Art Salon program for trans, non-binary youth and LGBTQ plus youth, as well as our other teen programs, Rosh Chodesh um, for teen girls, Shevet for teen boys. Um, I am also the, um, the parent of two teen, teenage sons, um, from whom I learn a ton. And one of them, um, a very, I'm a very proud parent of a trans 12 year old. And tonight, many of the things that you are all here to learn from, I am right alongside you learning as we go. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, Alicia. And I'm Rabbi Daniel Brenner, um, and I'm the Vice President for Education for Moving Traditions. Um, a little bit about me participating tonight. I am a cisgender, straight, suburban husband and dad. All three of my uh, children uh, are grown and also are cisgender and straight. And I have a deep commitment and connection to this uh, webinar that we're doing tonight because one of the incredible young people that grew up with my children, who was in my carpool when uh, we used to carpool the children to our Schechter day school, um, and was part of our close-knit Jewish community, one of those people came out as a non-binary trans individual. And whenever I think about the world that I want to create, I think about this one person. Um, I'm grateful that I've met a lot of other wonderful uh, trans folk and non-binary folk and gender expansive folk. Um, and I'm really excited by the conversation that we're going to have tonight. Um, so Alicia, I'm going to just describe very briefly Moving Traditions, three core Jewish principles that we focus on uh, with teens. Um, those three things are shlemut, which is personal wholeness, chesed, which is caring connection, and tzedek, working for a just and equitable world. And those are the three things that we just hope that every teen feels, like feels their personal voice, feels, feels a sense of wholeness, um, feels connections to others and, and has that connection happen within the context of the Jewish community. And finally, um, we really know that many of the teens that we work with they see what's wrong with this world and helping them find ways to positively change it. That's amazing. And that's what we, we hope that all of the teens that are involved in all the programs that we have for youth um, will find. So I'm really, really excited uh, to pass it back to you, Alicia, to get started. So much, Daniel. And yeah, as Daniel said, those three values are part of all the work that we do. Um, it, we believe that gender and how teens see gender relate to Shlemut, Chesed, Tzedek, it may be why you are here tonight, um, because you want to support more, ho more holistically a young person in your life. Um, you might want to be showing up with Chesed, kindness, or partnering with the teens in your life who see this as an issue of, of real justice and pursuit of justice. So for all of those reasons, we're so glad you're here. And I just want to say we're in a moment going to share in the chat, for those of you who are not familiar with Moving Traditions, a link to some of our programs those three values show up not only in our Salem program, which I already mentioned, um, which is min uh, in many ways going to be highlighted through the things that we're discussing this evening, um, but all of our programs for young people. So we encourage you, if you have young folks in your life, check out our programs, we'd love to have them. And I'm gonna now turn it back over to Daniel for the first part of our conversation. Awesome. So um, I feel like I have learned a lot about um, gender expansive language and about trans issues, and I'm still learning. Um, and I really am thrilled to be in conversation tonight um, in, in a minute with Essie Shahar Hill, who was it's like so important in our development or CLM program, um, who I met in Chicago a number of years ago and uh, have been learning from ever since. Um, and I know um, just, just a little bit about uh, Essie's professional bio, Essie's a licensed clinical social worker, a therapist, a counselor, um, and more importantly, an amazing Jewish educator who was working with so many Jewish communities, and I would have to say transforming Jewish communities. So thank you for everything that you are doing, Essie. Um, and, you know, I, I, I want to start this off by saying, as a parent, um, I've read a lot of the research of the Trevor Project, and it scares me. Um, it scares me because I see um, mental health 
concerns and suicide rates that are high. It's these things scare me as a parent, as a concerned human. Um, so I, I often think, oh my God, um, this is a lot. But I also feel like we're starting to learn more. Um, and part of that learning more is just learning about what this all means in the language that people are using around it. So Essie, if, if you could, could you just say a little bit about like, where have we been in the last decade? What is, what are the things that, that, I mean, ha, how has the language changed? What is the, the, the most current language we're thinking and talking about? Even, even me, I like think this is about gender expansive or trans or, or both. I, I don't even know exactly the words to say, even in this question. So help me, help me frame that a little bit, help demystify just a little bit what the language is all about. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much for those kind words in the introduction. Um, so I just want to start by saying that language matters, right? And I think folks who are in this space think that too. That's why we're here. Um, and I had a really fascinating conversation in preparation for this panel about like, why are we focusing on language? Um, because words matter, but there's so many bigger picture things that matter as well. Um, and I see those things as very much connected. So the reason that language matters, the reason that you feel that weight on these words that you use um, is because words are not just sounds that come out of our mouths. Um, they're, they're tools that we use to either uphold society's values and systems, or they can also be tools to deconstruct those systems. Um, and sometimes people are really puzzled why uh, others are really sensitive to language. I myself am sensitive to language and the words we use, and I'm often the person like up in arms about using the right language. And the reason that folks like myself and many others are sensitive to language is because these words are indicative of much larger systems. Um, so if you think about different phrasing of certain events in the world, right? Sometimes we hear riot, sometimes we hear rebellion, sometimes we hear uprising to describe the same thing. And those three words have really, really different connotations around power and around systems. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying like, why are we even talking about language? Why do words matter? And why are people sensitive to words is because they're indicative of so things that are so much bigger than that. And there's some kind of bias baked in or perceived bias baked into the words that you choose. Absolutely. So, and it feels really important to think about like who created those words, right? And are we using language that other people created? Um, and I think this is really like getting at today's topic around the expansiveness of language around gender and the evolution of language around gender. And I think often people feel really overwhelmed, like, oh my goodness, in the last 10 years, the words have changed so much. I don't even know. Like, we're like the kid who doesn't even know how to ask the question at Passover, right? It's like the words have changed so much. We don't even know how to ask the question. Um, and sure. the reason that language has expanded so much is because there's a whole lot of people who have been left out of language, right? So a lot of the young people I work with, both um, in individual therapy and in my Tselem group, feel really strongly that language matters and that they historically, we historically, myself included as a trans person, have been left out of the lexicon that's been handed down to us. Um, okay, okay. Let me stop you for a second. I, I don't want to cut you off, Essie, but like you just said, myself as a trans person. So does trans person as, as a language capture the folks who are saying, I don't fit into the gender binary, or is that, is that not enough? Okay, so trans is short for transgender, describes someone whose gender or their gender identity is different from what they were assigned at birth. It's a big umbrella category, it can look like a lot of different ways, but it describes in the, in the biggest sense of the word, anyone whose gender is different from what they were assigned at birth when they were born or before they were born often. Um, <laughs> and there are folks under the trans umbrella who do fit into the gender binary. So we have folks like trans men, we have folks like trans women. Um, those are binary people, men and women. They happen to be trans, um, but they, they do fit into the binary. And then there's other folks 
who don't fit into the gender binary. Um, and the gender binary for folks who are like, what is this person talking about? The gender binary is this Western construct and system of thinking that there are only two genders, man and woman, and that everybody in the whole world fits into one of those two boxes. So there are lots and lots of people, again, myself included, and a lot of the young people I work with who don't fit into man or woman. Um, so that those folks might identify as non-binary people, people who don't fit into the binary. Those folks might self-describe as gender queer or a gender, not having a gender or gender fluid or a million other terms. Um, and there's so many words that exist and are being created every second. And for folks who are feeling panicky right now, as I just like listed all those terms, um, I tell people to hold on to these definitions loosely. So it's not your job to memorize every single definition of every single gender term. Hold on to the definitions loosely because they mean different things to different people. And it's more important to know how to say to someone, oh, you know, I've heard that word, but can you tell me more about what that means to you? Right? It's more important to be able to ask that question than to know exactly every single definition of like demi boy and demi girl and gender fluid, right? So I, oh, I yes, so, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So like just from my initial question, if I was going to say something like there's cisgender people and then there's blank, the way that you would say that is trans people or transgender people. Okay. That's, that's very, very helpful to me. Um, and there's also a gender, there's also a bunch of other things, but in general, the trans umbrella is one that you would use that, that, that for, for, for most folks, for most genderqueer folks, that is a okay way to say it. Yeah, I think most people who might describe as non-binary or genderqueer would also identify as trans. But again, there's as many different expressions and words and preferred language as there are people. Yes. Okay, so let's get to the that there are people. So I've, I've had this experience many times with, um, with my own children who are young adults. And they have friends that have come over either to my backyard or have been in some other situation. And I honestly am not sure whether it's appropriate for me to say like, hey, what are your pronouns or what, like help me in that kind of situation where it's like not, I'm just like relating to a person and I'm going, I'm gonna to relate to this person as a person and not gender them or just like relate to them just as a human. But then like at a certain point, I feel like, is it right for me to say, or how would I even say, can you tell me about your gender identity? I don't wanna be, a, I don't wanna be, a, you know, a nudge, but what should I do? How should I even approach this and make space for somebody who has, um, who, for whom it, it is part, a very important part of their life to, to have that seen? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it depends on your relationship with the person. If this is like a passing person on the street, some like a kiddo who, probably not a kiddo, your children are probably grown, um, a young person, right? Okay. <laughs> who's just coming over to your house for the first time, you don't necessarily have a relationship with them, it would not be appropriate to go up to them and be like, hello, I'm Rabbi Daniel Brenner. Please what? talk Please about your gender, your gender identity in this box. Yeah. Right, like that's not cool, that's not chill, that's, right. not, I'm, I'm, that's I'm, not appropriate. Not but doing. if you're wondering like, oh, there, I'm meeting this new person and I don't actually know how to refer to this person, um, you can ask someone's pronouns. And the best way to do that is to share your own. So when you introduce yourself, oh, you're like, that's so good, Essie, I love this. Okay, right. yeah. So when okay. you are like, hi, I'm so, like, I don't know your kid's name. I'm so-and-so's dad, Rabbi Brenner. Um, I use he, him pronouns. You are modeling to that person the information you're looking for. So you shared your name, you shared your pronouns. That's going to sit cue that person to share their name and their pronouns, likely. Um, so that's like the easiest tip is to introduce yourself first with the information that you would like from the other person. That's really helpful. I was in a situation one time. I just have to say this, and this is an aside, Essie. I was at um, a big hotel gathering with a whole big, big, huge family, and I had a conversation for over an hour with somebody just I just had a great conversation at the very end um the person said oh by the way I'm trans and I was like oh no did I not like make an entrance like I, I wasn't really sure what it was but 
I was like, okay, that's cool. I was like, okay, cool. Like it didn't really impact the whole hour we spent together, but like I did like, it did register to my mind and I couldn't, I was too awkward about how to like, even I didn't have your advice yet. So uh, <laughs> it really did. It really did help me, um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, how to be proactive about it. So, totally. Thank and you. I would also, I would also just add, like, if that feels awkward to you to like share your pronouns, first of all, just practice these things get easier. And also there's other ways to share your pronouns. So if you were at a conference with a name tag, you could write your pronouns on your name tag in your email signature in your zoom name, right? You see lots of these folks have our pronouns in our zoom name too. So yep. there's lots of ways to share that. That's awesome. All right. So we have some wonderful questions coming in the chat. I want to throw one at you. Um, can you explain Debbie asks, can you explain how sex assignment fits in with gender identity and the rest of what you are addressing as binary? Yeah, can you say it one more time? Can you explain how sex assignment fits in with gender identity and the rest of what you are addressing? Oh, yeah, as totally. Okay, okay cool. totally. So um, sex assigned at birth is you know, when somebody has an ultrasound when they're pregnant and the doctor says, congratulations, it's a insert the sex here. Or when a baby is born, that doctor looks between that baby's legs, sees what's there or what isn't yeah, there. Our doctor know. saw our twins and said, oh, frickin' frack. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that actually happens. So that yeah. is really based on medical terminology. It's kind of the medical category that we're placed into when we're born. Um, and gender identity is something totally different. Gender identity is one's own sense of who you are in terms of gender. Um, gender identities are categories that we as a society have constructed and sort of have unwritten, sometimes written rules about. Um, and so those things, sex assigned at birth and gender are separate. For some people, those are in alignment and what they are sort of expected to be based on what's between their legs um, is the same as how they identify. That person is called a cisgender person, C-I-S gender. Um, it's a Latin prefix meaning on the same side of. Um, and someone whose gender is different from what they were assigned at birth um, is transgender. Um, so they're two totally different things. One, um, you know, you can maybe tell by doing some chromosomal analysis of people or looking at someone's hormone levels and the other you cannot tell unless you ask somebody because gender is an internal um, sense and you can't tell what someone's gender is just by looking. And I also want to bust yeah, the yeah. myth that sex assigned at birth is binary because it's also not. Um, there are more than two sexes. There are intersex folks whose biological characteristics don't neatly fit into one of two boxes. So even in nature, even in biology, we have um, spectra and we have diversity in experiences and expression. Yes, and for the fellow science nerds out there in the world, hello, I see you. Um, Robert Sapolsky, Stanford University biology professor has an amazing lecture about this very thing in which he talks about the science of transgender, the, 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 basis, the scientific basis of transgender lives, which is um, all about how little we know from what we can see in chromosomes and genetic. And it's like, he's going, he's saying that there's something real that science is just beginning to understand and I've, I've found that to be incredibly grounding for me um, not only that they're intersex folks but like the way that the brain and the body connects is just much more profound than we ever imagined so that's great I want one more question for you and then I feel like we're going to move on but here's a question that I've heard from a lot of parents and it is basically this what age are kids able to like sense these things? Like, is, is there an answer to this question? Like, what, what, how do you respond to that if, if you're asked by a parent or somebody who wants to know? Totally. So people, I get this question a lot of like, when does this gender thing start happening? Yeah. Um, and my answer to that is it probably has started happening before that baby was even born because in the society we have things like gender reveal parties and we paint some rooms pink and some rooms blue and we choose the things we're going to buy for our child before they're even born and before we know anything about them other than what's between their legs. So that is where I will start. Um, and on a more concrete level to actually answer, I think the question that this person is trying to ask is um, young people start labeling and knowing what their own gender is between the age of three and five. Mm -hmm. 
So it's very, very young. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that young person um, will sort of self-identify in the same way for the rest of their life from what they say when they're four. It might be different from what they say, you know, 20 years later. Um, but young people do start to self-label themselves between ages three and five. And so um, it is really important to I wouldn't even say like have these conversations, but just ensure that our young people and our really little people have lots of models of all the different ways to be in the world. Um, I was talking recently um, with someone who was sharing how their cousin was having like the talk with a seven year old about like how queer people exist in the world. And it needed to be like a conversation where this person said like, sometimes men love women and sometimes men love men. And it was like this kind of conversation at age seven. Um, and I found myself getting really frustrated because I was like, that didn't have to be that conversation at age seven. If that young person had grown up with storybooks with different kinds of families, if that young person had grown up with different kinds of people in their lives and different kinds of relationships. My and kids saw in their pre-K, they were like, okay, what's going on over there? Those are two dads or whatever. Right, you know, like, right, totally. So it doesn't have to be like this conversation, like this sit down, we need to explain what, I was giving an example around like queer people, but in this case, like we don't have to have a conversation around what transgender people are. Um, it's more just like having lots of different kinds of um, dolls that look different kinds of ways and storybooks and movies um, and having different people in your life, right? So that folks know that there's more than just two ways to be in the world. Um, so that would be the way that I would start to address that question. I love that answer. That, that's, that's fantastic. I am sure there are going to be a lot of other questions around some of these issues, especially as we're in this moment of national political, you know, hubba, 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 you know, third graders can't learn about gender, you know, we're in this moment. Um, so hearing your uh, really bigger picture answer about how culture has to change is really helpful and is really wonderful to hear at SC. So um, I hope uh, we'll continue this conversation as we move forward tonight, but thank you for kicking this off. And I'm not, now gonna pass things over to Alicia for uh, a little bit more. Thank you so much, Daniel, and thank you, Essie. Um, and I just want to name, we see lots of questions coming in the chat. We also had questions people submitted in advance. Um, as we go, we're trying to make sure we address as many of them as we can. And if we don't get to your question tonight, please feel free to, um, to reach out to us at Moving Traditions after. We're going to be emailing um, you with many of the resources we share tonight, um, and we will do our best to answer or point you in the right direction. So um, I am really excited now to be talking with you, Lane, and you, Lauren, um, for this next part of the conversation. Um, Lane, I'm so excited for your perspective. I, you're only a college freshman, and yet you are very already have quite a resume as a queer um, activist, advocate, educator. Um, you actually are leading, helping to lead one of our Salem groups in the DC and Virginia area. Um, you have written a guide that we're actually sharing with people tonight, um, helping educators teach about gender and identity and LGBTQ plus identities. Um, and your mom, Lauren, who um, in addition to being your mom and um, is also currently working uh, as a social work intern, um, has worked as a nonprofit leader, a lay leader in synagogues, and the conversation with the two of you, I'm so excited for. Um, I will just say, uh, you know, one of the things that really jumped out to me um, from what Essie was saying around how language in and of itself is a system um, that upholds our understandings of things, right? We use language in order to understand the world. And as a result, the very system of language, like it either constricts our understanding or expands it. And that right now what is happening around the effort to expand language on gender is attempting to help us recognize and understand that there is more to it um, than that. Um, that for me, I think was a moment of like, uh oh. <laughs> um, and I just um, would like to kind of put to the two of you um, in your own relationship as parent, young person, um, 
Lane, in your experience in talking with your mom about your gender identity, um, did this idea resonate in any way that it was in many ways just the language in and of itself? How did that play out? I think um, it does resonate personally. The way that I processed a lot of my gender feelings was just diving straight into the deep end of queer theory. Um, it ended up being a really central part of how I made sense of what I was feeling. And to this day, I joke to my friends that my gender comes through a required reading list. Um, at the same time, I think that language is still a tool and I'm fortunate, fortunate enough that my family had a lot of the tools that I did. Um, right before I started questioning my gender, um, my mom went back to school to get her master's in social work. And as part of this process, she took a race and oppression theory class that revolutionized the Schlesinger family dinner table. And what that meant for me is that along with conversations like, how was school today? How are your college applications going? We were having conversations like, I listened to a podcast about whether cops belong at Pride and how do we deconstruct the gender binary? And as someone who really made sense of themselves through language beyond the pronouns I was using, but really diving into like, what is this whole gender nonsense and how did we get here? It was really comforting to see that my family mem members under thing understood things like intersectionality and gender as a social construct, because it meant that I could be my most authentic selves around them and that I could engage them in the questions that I was thinking to myself and I could maybe encourage them to also think about gender in a really broad and exciting sense. Thank you so much, Lane. Um, Thanks, Lainey. I'll Venmo you that hundred bucks now. <laughs> well, on that note, actually, Lauren, um, on the flip side of this, as Lane's describing their experience, um, were there any aha moments for you that kind of revolutionized the, the conversation around the Schlesinger family dinner table? First of all, if any of you are wondering what that looked like, the conversation between Rabbi Daniel and Essie really modeled it perfectly, like just peppering Laney and their twin. How does this work? How does that work? Um, but I'd say the aha moment for me was kind of was reconciling my own kind of social construction of gender, you know, the binary, um, and realizing how attached I truly was to that. And Mike, all those questions, all that seeking to understand, it was a little bit selfish because I think I asked those questions wanting still to slot Laney into one of those categories. Yeah, so everywhere. Right. So yeah. the aha was this is going to take a while, but I don't want to wait for Laney to know that I accept them just the way they are until I get it. Because I still don't fully, you know, like I kind of get it up here, but they say the longest trip is from here to here. So I accept here. I'm trying to understand here and I'm hoping it all integrates somewhat soon. <laughs> Lauren, what you just said, I think is something that resonates with me personally and some conversations I've had with my, with my son, my 12 year olds. Um, in realizing like this moment of shifting of being like, oh, the way that you are understanding gender and what that even means is completely different than how, like what is here in my brain. And I'm, it, I, that's okay. Like I, what I can do, right? Like I'm, it may take me a lot of time. I don't even know if I can like deconstruct everything that's in my brain of how I, as a, you know, 42 year old who like has grown up in the society that has taught me gender is this, like, it may take me time to really understand how you understand it, but I can, I can accept that and make a shift then in my language and how I'm talking to um, and be in a constant journey of trying to learn and understand about 
you know, which is what we do as parents constantly, right? Just trying to see and understand who our kid is as they continue to grow in all kinds of ways. Um, yeah, I like that, you know, we like, it's actually just about accepting that we might not be seeing it the same way. And I'm doing this because when, when the three of us spoke in preparation for tonight, Lauren, you did something about talking about the lenses, the different lenses of gender that you were realizing you guys were wearing. I'm wondering if you would say a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, just that I, I have a totally different focus, a totally different frame of reference. And one thing that learning about theories of oppression does is it teaches us like, so what if you stop thinking about it this way and start just seeing it a different way? And once, and it takes practice, right? Um, but I'm very motivated to try and very grateful to both Lane and their twin for letting us pepper them. They've never once said, it's not my job to educate you, but I bet they were thinking it. Thank you for that. Lane, actually, I'd like to just talk to you as an educator for, for a moment, because you actually, you, you have um, written some educational guides around all of this. And I want to thank my colleague Paige who mentioned in the chat that it was through our Kokolinu um, Teen Feminist Fellowship, which you're, you're an alum of. Um, and we're really excited to share that as a resource with all of you um, who are here tonight. So you can see that for yourself. Um, but we got a question ahead of time from someone who registered that I feel like given the work you've done on this, you might be able to help answer which is that the words, with, as words continue to evolve, it can be really confusing for people, right? Um, and some of them, for those of us who are still trying to evolve and understand and catch up, the fact that some of the words seem redundant or overlap, um, that they're changing, that can be hard in and of itself. And the example is, for example, pangender and polygender, right? Um, how do we, do you have any advice for how we kind of keep up with these evolving and sometimes overlapping words and meanings and ways that we can try to understand what they are? Yeah, I think as Essie mentioned, um, you're like, I don't know, sixth grade prefixes and suffixes unit really come into play. So the example, pan, all, poly, multiple, like there's an overlap there. But like they mentioned, the differences matter. And I counter this a lot when I work with queer youth, mainly because they are really tapped into online spaces. The internet's very good at things moving fast. And so the language that we're using is being generated faster than it ever has before. Um, and our queer youth, our queer and trans youth are at the forefront of that. Even though I, as a queer person who is maybe five to seven years older than them, uh, I will be in spaces where there are words I've never heard of and Google is my best friend. But I think what this really boils down to when we're confused and we're like, well, what really is the difference between pan and poly or omni and bi? Um, it boils down to this idea that youth who identify with these labels that are specific or labels that you've never heard of, they're in the driver's seat. They get to choose the language that they feel most validated by and most affirmed by, and they feel seen by. And because you're figuring out so much as a teenager, it can be so exciting and so just affirming to find a word or phrase that you think it perfectly fits. It's like the magic lock and key, even if it's a word that 20 other people are using on the internet and your parents have never heard of. To someone who I don't, who I think isn't seen by these labels, someone like you or me who are like, I don't really know what this is. This is new to me. I think it can be hard to see the appeal or understand the differences and nuances of each one. But the reality is that doesn't really matter at the end of the day because there are a lot of people who take pride in that label, who feel like it resonates with a part of their soul. And we don't really need to know the dictionary definition every time because it's our job to support them. We can have an idea of how it relates to them and their big picture sense of gender, um, but ultimately sort of the like, well, is this redundant? Is a thought that I think a lot of us have, and it's a thought that we need to challenge because 
language, you know, often is redundant and we need to challenge that these queer terms are set and linear and make sense to the general pop population because it's not necessarily their job to make sense to everyone, but it's our job to support them regardless of the word is 20 years old or 20 seconds. Thank you for that, Lane. I feel like it is such a good um, point to transition into the next part of our conversation um, for, for two reasons. Um, one, I feel you, you named kind of two things that are happening. And for those of us who are here as parents or educators or other adults for us to kind of keep in mind. One is this idea, like we talked about, like that young people, queer young people, um, in particular, right, are, are recognizing that there's this system that does not fully encapsulate the fullness of who we all are, who they are, right, and are collectively helping to expand that, deconstruct that. Um, and so there's both that and we can be learning and listening and realizing they're giving us a larger way of understanding of a deeply important part of who people are and there's also the piece of individual people, right? Who are using these words to communicate to us, this is who I am. And in the in, you know, in the one-on-one, -on -one, again, as a parent, there are so many times that it's actually my job to sit back and ask questions and simply just try to learn and understand who my kid is. And this is one of those that we can be following their lead. Um, and um but the questions that we ask, as you said, can be just as important. Essie mentioned earlier that we're coming up to Passover, right? And the, from the Passover Seder, the child who doesn't know how to ask, right? I think that thinking about the children in the Passover Seder and the different ways of asking questions um, is really an, a wonderful model for us that as parents, as adults, one of the best things that we can be doing is just be thinking about how we show up to ask questions because we want to seek to understand who you are and who you are. Um, and on that note, um, one of the resources we'll be sharing with all of you at the end of the night is from our Salem B. Mitzvah Family Education Program, um, a, a list of questions starters that some of the, um, the trans and non-binary kiddos in that program put together of questions I'd love for parents to ask. Um, and we're happy to share that with all of you. Lane and Lauren, thank you so much for your contribution to this conversation. I'm gonna turn it back over to Daniel. Yes, Lane and Lauren, that was really fantastic. And um, if you have not checked out the chat of this Zoom, wow, this is one of the best chats I've ever seen. I think in, all, in the history of chats, we have the most helpful people answering people's questions. It's just, it's so fantastic to see. So check out the chat. And if you have a question, please, please add a question. We will, towards the end of this uh, seminar uh, session, webinar, what is it? I don't know. Towards the end of this, we will have a moment to, to get to some of those questions. Um, but right now, we want to ground this conversation. Um, we are proud to be part of uh, the Jewish community to be working with Jewish educators, to be working with Jewish families. Um, and one of the questions that I think a lot of folks um, wrestle with is, we have this ancient tradition. What in this tradition do we lift up at this moment to speak to these questions around gender? Um, and what in the tradition might help us um, ground this conversation um, in a way of treating other people um, that uh, really, really values uh, their entire selves. So there's, there aren't many folks who have spent their life thinking about Judaism and gender and feminism and queer theory. We happen to have one of them right here with Rabbi Tamara Cohen, who is our chief of program for Moving Traditions um, and who was a driving force behind the Tzellum program and has really been out there um, helping us think about uh, trans and gender expansive youth. So Tamara, what from our tradition do you lift up? 
Thank you to everyone who has spoken so far. Um, and what do I, uh, part of what, what I lift up is, is the voices um, and realities of um, Jews today. And, and um, they are the teachers with us. Um, and part of what I lift up is the, the tension and the creativity of Jewish tradition, which um, always reads in creative and new ways. So we have our texts and in a certain way they're fixed and in another way they're not at all fixed because we have this incredible tradition of interpretation and reinterpretation. Um, one way of talking about it is Midrash um, and that gives us a way in um, that is quite traditional, but also quite and also quite radical. So a few things that um, I wanted to to share and suggest that we uh, continue in this tradition. Um, the first is the way that God <laughs> um, is talked about um, in the Torah is actually much more broad <laughs> um, and non-binary <laughs> or uh, trans <laughs> um, than the way that we talk about God in synagogue life um, and in ritual. And I, I want that to change. Uh, it, it's different around my Shabbat table. And I hope after tonight, it'll be more different around yours too. Um, Help us so understand that. We, like, yeah, so, where so do you see that in the tradition? We, we have God as a midwife, God as a mother bird, God as a wellspring, and we have God as a singular plural. So for example, the word Elohim, um, which is one of the ways that we talk about that, that God is referred to in the Torah um, at the very beginning, that's who created the, the, the heavens and the earth. Um, Elohim is a plural, a plural singular word. <laughs> um, and so uh, there's a lot of conversation in the chat about they, them. Um, I love that that um idea um and then so you're we basically have, saying they them is straight out of the torah uh yeah yeah okay. um, and Good. it's capital in the in, in the torah um it, it and it's a wonderful way that educators um can uh help kids and each other uh, embrace the the wide reality um, or experience for many of us of the divine um, as um, beyond gender, all genders, um, different things for different people. Um, and then we have this great um, piece right in the creation of humanity that we're created, B'Tselem Elohim, this idea that we're created in the image of that plural singular God. <laughs> Um, which gets used a lot in different ways, um, but not always in ways that are encompassing of gender. And here's another example. So right after we're created B'Tselem Elohim, it says male and female God created them. How do we, what do we do with this? Um, either it can be an extremely painful um, moment of reinforcing the binary. And for me, um, it, it was for many years, or it can be an opportunity for reinterpretation. And so um, the creation story is full of uh, the binary of darkness and light, day and night. And yet we know that day and night also include twilight and dawn. And, and it's not really just two things. Um, there's the beauty of the, of the sky that, um, and of the the continuum and more than continuum. And so that can be true too about um, the way that we understand what it means that, that God created humanity, male and female, or perhaps all genders are, are mixed up in that. And, and there is Midrash too, um, to support that ancient Midrash that if there was one being created. There are all sorts of ways of doing, uh, of understanding that traditionally and in rabbinic tradition, we actually have um, a legal system that doesn't only have um, male and female, man and woman. It actually has other genders as well. That's part of Jewish tradition um, and a part that we are, are recovering now, um, in part uh, thanks to lots of feminist and um, trans uh, rabbis and scholars. Uh, so there's a lot to to um, be proud of in a certain way in our tradition, 
along with um, the, the necessity of doing the work that Jewish feminists started and LGBTQ and non-binary Jews are continuing uh, creating um, midrash and, and, and making changes in how we experience and what we, what we hold up. Um, from Jewish tradition. So, um, so you, you, yes. Okay, just, just stop for a second. Gender expansive theology there in the Torah. Gender expansive categories about legal or halachic things yeah. in the Talmud. What about now? What about modern Judaism? Like when you see Jewish communities, um, where do you see that there is change that still needs to happen in terms of uh, rigid or narrow ways of thinking about gender. Okay, so um, one thing is um, something that we went through ourselves with, with in moving traditions, which was um, uh, how do we call the the rite of passage um, that happens to a child uh, when they're becoming a teen, or traditionally when they're becoming a Jewish adult? Um, in in that moment, we have a choice in our Jewish communities. Are we saying, okay, to become a Jewish adult, you have to declare yourself one gender or the other? Um, a bar or a bat mitzvah is what you're having or what you're becoming? Or do we create language? And lots of communities are creating language. We're calling it b'mitzvah or b'mitzvah and saying, um, let's decouple, first of all, <laughs> let's um, unattach that there's a, a moment at 12 or 13 that you need to have defined your gender and know what it is. Um, that can be a process that for some people happens at two or three, <laughs> um, as Essie said, for some people happens at five, for some people happens at 17, for some people happens at 50. Um, and uh, and, and is, is a, a different journey than the journey of what it means to be responsible as a Jew. So let's make space. We have the opportunity to do that. It's a very simple way to say, we are a community that recognizes um, and honors the diversity of gender experiences um, and, and wants to say that to everybody. And you know, I think a first step that many synagogues are having is saying, okay, you have a choice. What do you wanna call it? And different people call it different things. And another choice is to say, this is what we call it. This is our, um, this is our baseline. <laughs> Um, this is what, and it doesn't mean that you can't also have pride um, in, if you feel pride in being a girl and wanting to explore what that means. But the ritual itself um, it is, is not dependent on um, gendered Hebrew. Somebody said and talked in the chat about the, the, um, the issue of, of Hebrew is a gendered language, like many romance, like many languages. Um, and there are ways that people are challenging that, both in terms of creating new forms of Hebrew grammar, the non-binary Hebrew project, and also thinking, wait a second, maybe sometimes we can use the parts of speech that are not gendered. So we can call someone up for an aliyah to the Torah with um, the form of speech that says, um, come up to the Torah. <laughs> and then we don't have to say you male or you female or you, and we can say, I come from the family, um, me bait and, and claim my parents' names as opposed to having to say bat or ben, daughter or son. So those are, those are some examples. Um, of how things are changing in, in the Jewish world. Great. So oh, I have one last question, and I think that this is really a question to you, Rabbi Tamara Cohen, feminist. Um, how do you think about the term feminist and how it's changed? And do you feel that your, your, your own thinking about feminism has been changed by uh, the the trans uh, the 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 I, I don't even don't even, don't even know how to say this, but by the expansion into thinking about trans uh, issues, thinking Absolutely. beyond. I mean, when I was listening to to Lane talk about uh, coming out the way that that you did, I thought about the uh, workshop I, I created for my parents. Um, and <laughs> wait, I, we got to hear more about this. What was this? As, workshop? I, I mean, I was a. I'm the child of a second generation Jewish feminist. 
And there was a process of saying, wait, your feminism took me to one place and my feminism is going to take us to another place. And for us in our family, that that conflict was around um, sexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, Like it was like, okay, feminism means that all people are equal and the gender that you are doesn't necessitate the gender that you're attracted to or want to be with. That was an important moment. Um, and a challenging one um, in our context. And now feminism is is going beyond that um, also and saying, okay, um, what is it? We always said, I think um, early feminists too um, had an understanding that the terminology of what it means to be a woman or a man was socially constructed, but we understand that more now. Um, And There was a moment in feminism where some people, I think, wanted to erase gender differences. And one of the powerful things for me that I have learned and appreciated from trans and non-binary folks is is that we we can hold on to gender in its um, beautiful variety and fluidity and, and expansiveness. We don't have to get rid of it. We, what we wanna get rid of is the hierarchy. What we wanna get rid of is that some genders can have more power than others or um, more access than others. But so for me, yes, feminism is enriched. <laughs> Um, and and deepened, but the the conflicts that have that are in the news sometimes between feminists and, and trans folks, um, you know, uh, they they are sad. They are not necessary. As but far maybe as they're talking. sensationalizing something that really is like not the story. Really, the story is what I think you're saying, which is this is just expanding our way of understanding feminism and 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 maybe giving us a new way to think about. Um, I, I was thinking like there's so many colors in the rainbow, a new way of thinking about gender that like that people fear, but a lot of people see that as a better way. And it's a new way of thinking about our bodies, um, mm-hmm. the relationship between like how our bodies are in the world and the assumptions made about them that I think, you know, um, uh, the, the movements um, can teach each other and learn from each other. And I've learned a lot from, from trans feminism um, and I, we feed each other. And that's true within Judaism, within Judaism too. Not that everybody is at the same place. So for me and my family, we say Ruach instead of Melech, um, yes. which means, uh, at, and in, in moving traditions, we often offer it in a few ways. Some people's uh, relationship to Jewish tradition is means that they're going to reinterpret a word but not change the word. That's okay. <laughs> um, that that works for you. I want to I want to actually change the word that I'm saying, which which means uh, spirit. Um, and I want to teach. I want to use that as a way that I'm teaching my kids to be literate, especially because they go back and forth between and to code switch in a certain way. Sure. Um, there are places where gender binary language still exists more and there are places where we challenge it. Um, but different people are gonna be in different places with where they are with that comfort of, of yeah. how much to change. Beautiful. So I wanna throw things back to Essie just for one second because yeah. um, first of all, thank you Tamara, that was fantastic, really deepens our knowledge of Judaism and just a a different way to think about our history and tradition. So Essie, you have been in so many different contexts in the Jewish community. Like, I just want to just throw the question out to you. What is the work that needs to be done in the Jewish community? Just going to end with that little question, are you, Rabbi? Yeah, I mean, just like, (laughs) what's your gut say? Um... I think my gut says, get in touch with your values, get in touch with your intentions, and listen to marginalized voices on how to get there. So I think that often intentions are really good. I think often Jewish institutions have really beautiful and meaningful values that guide their work. And there's some dots missing between 
upholding those values in a way that is expansive and welcoming and supportive of everyone's wholeness. I love that we kind of started by talking about wholeness. Um, so I would say listen to, in this case, trans voices, listen to Jews of color, listen to the converts in your community, listen to the disabled folks in your community. Um, the answers are there. It's, it's, the, the, the wisdom is there, just listen to us and we'll, we'll tell you how to get there. Um, yeah, that would be, that would be my piece of advice. I'll, I'll try to listen. Thank you so much. So Alicia, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thank you so much. Um, Essie and Tamara um, for everything you just shared. And Essie, I was just sitting here thinking about something that you just said and how it really brings us back to, I think there's one take home, um, I hope for all of the parents and educators and adults on here. You know, I think that, I know I as a parent often want to, to know all of the answers of what I need to do um, and really to do that we often need to, we actually need to put ourselves in the seat of listening and um, of, of just hearing. And so um, you may walk out of this webinar tonight um, feeling a little bit more comfortable with some of the terms. You might not, and that is all okay. The one take home is that what we are hearing from our youth right now is that they are both understanding things and asking to be understood differently than we might have and it is it's it the best thing we can be do we can be doing is asking and listening um and one more beautiful thing that was that was just said between both um rabbi tamara and um essie about the way the jewish community can be moving and that work is already happening it is inherent to our tradition of of interpreting and reinterpreting and expanding understandings. Um, and there's some beautiful work being done right now. We're gonna share with you um, again, in just a moment, we're going to drop a link in the chat to um, a resource page. Many of the things we referenced tonight, it includes, we have a blessing of the children for your Friday night Shabbat table that has non-binary Hebrew. Um, there are other sources out there of ways in the Jewish community, we are giving space to expand understandings. And I wanna actually close with one more beautiful piece um, for your inspiration. Um, we are going to uh, show a music video um, to a beautiful song, Kisa Machteni by um, Ben Pilario, a songwriter whose wife is actually one of our Tzalem group leaders. Um, and the song that we're about to see, um, Ben wrote it in non-binary Hebrew, which is also a new movement of trying to create a third gendered option um, of, of Hebrew. Um, and this is Ben's interpretation of what it means to be created in the image of God, which um, he said that he needed to write it in non-binary Hebrew in order to be able to expand his understanding. Much of like we said throughout this, that language, the words we choose end up in some ways limiting our understanding. Um, and so if we are willing to step back and ask if there's other ways to describe how we see someone, how we understand God, our own understandings will expand. So um, we are going to close with this beautiful music video. We're going to drop some, some resources into the chat. Um, and um, I just want to thank all of you, um, all of our panelists, and everyone who came tonight to be here to listen, to learn, to understand, and be on the lookout for an email from us as well um, with the recording for tonight. We saw lots of questions about the recording and also a survey link. I really appreciate you taking two minutes to let us know if you got from tonight what you came here for and what else we can be doing to help you in service of Jewish teens. Thank you so much. Adonai before Aleche, the Maase Adeche Aranein, Magadlu Maase Maase Adonai Me Odam Kumacho.